Thank you very much, Brian. It's really a great honor to be here, uh, particularly uh, at an event sponsored by McLaurin CSF. I, I think their mission of this type of integration is exactly what a modern culture needs, uh, even though sometimes it may not necessarily think it needs it. Um, as I will kind of mention in the talk, I think one of the key words, even though it's an overused word, but it is always the question about integration. How does one begin to integrate often these areas that often we see as divided? What I'd like to do this, this afternoon is share with you some contents of this new document that Brian mentioned, um, uh, a document that was put out by the Pontifical Council for Justice and Peace called The Vocation of the Business Leader. Uh, the Catholic Church uh, has had a kind of um, uh, a mixed relationship with business throughout its 2,000 year history. Uh, but in many respects, what this document was an attempt to do is to take the wisdom of that tradition and try to boil it down to a way that was accessible to a larger audience. And uh, there was a group of us that were involved in putting this document together for the council. The document is actually structured in a very easy way. Uh, it's what they call see, judge, and act. I have to tell you a quick story. When we were writing the document, uh, one of the people on the document was a businessman. Uh, his name is Pierre Lecoq. He's French. He's the CEO of a $2 billion multinational corporation that has 12 different plants around the world. And the academics came forth with the first draft, and he says, boys, boys, guys, he said, uh, this, is, this is okay, but business people aren't going to understand it. Uh, you, better, you better rethink this. And we said, okay, all right. Uh, how would you encourage us to rethink it? And he says, I think this idea of see seeing clearly, judging with the right principles, and acting on those principles is a way to structure it. And so we structured it according to Pierre. And overall, the response has been relatively positive, particularly by practitioners, that they find it least understandable, unlike some of the other documents that come out of the Vatican, but that's another issue. Um, uh, the document, uh, although not to be hypercritical there, uh, I think a lot of the documents as a tradition is always something that one needs the ongoing reflection on. The document's on the web, actually, if you put up, if you, it's, it's, it's downloadable, with PDF and things of that sort, but there, as Brian said, there are extra copies there. My hope uh, as we engage this question on this topic of vocation is that you will not see what I say as simply a bunch of comp concepts or a bunch of abstract principles, but that hopefully, uh, and, and I hope this will be the case, that you will see your stories in the ideas that I want to express. If you don't see it in the stories of your life, there is either I have done a very bad job or you have not been engaging enough to try to relate to the personal stories that you have in relationship to this idea. Why do I say that? Everyone sitting in this room has a view of work. And this view of work has been nurtured, has been created, has been developed by our parents, by the stories of our lives, by our neighborhoods, by our education, by where we were brought up. All these types of things have influenced us with a particular view. Sometimes we're not always very articulate about what that view is, but it is there. Many of the stories are very positive stories. I suspect many of you, as I look out into the room, are professionals. And the reason why you're in the particular jobs that you're in is because your parents and other things have been a great gift to your life that has gotten you there. But like all things, our stories are not always that great. There are other stories that may, in a sense, create a certain degree of baggage that we also have to confront if we are to grow in the lives of what we have. I remember one particular story when I was growing up. I grew up on the south side of Chicago uh, to, uh, in a blue-collared neighborhood uh, to Irish immigrants, uh, both my parents, my mother and father were from Ireland. And I was walking out the door one night on a Saturday night, and my father looked at me and he says, Michael, Michael, you'll be a good boy there, Michael. I said, sure, Dad, whatever. And before I can take another step, he said, Michael, Michael, if you can't be good, you be careful. <laughs> All right, I think I can do that. Well, an unfortunate event happened to me that night, and my father had to come and pick me up from a Chicago police station. I'll, I'll spare you the details about why he had to do that. But he walked into the police station, he looked at me and he said, Michael, Michael, I think you better just be good. 
right? Now, my father and I had all sorts of kind of issues that we were kind of dealing with as father and son, but we do tend to live in a culture that tends to constantly focus on being careful, right? We have designated drivers that take home drunk and stupid friends. We have safe sex thinking that somehow non-productive disease-free sex will make up for its procreative and unitive meaning. We have an educational system that is constantly attempting for people to get from one thing to the other, to get the right grade, to get the right score, all in which to be careful to get to the next step. And yet our students have lost the love of learning. And we find ourselves sometimes in career modes that we're constantly attempting to get to the next step, to say the right thing, to do the right I issue, whatever it might be, to move to the next thing. And yet we sometimes lost a sense of what are we working for. This talk on the whole idea of being careful, and let's be clear, it is important to be careful. That's not the issue. But sometimes all the talk of the issue of being careful is that we become distracted from and we ignored the question of what does good work mean. And that's the fundamental focus I think this document is about, about what is good business. Because our concern about being careful has tended to create a utilitarian vision, even though we may not even use this word, but a utilitarian vision of the world that we have come to be, we have lost touch about the fundamental truth of who we are. And in that, in that lost touch of that truth, we have lost a fundamental sense of freedom to be who we were created to be. And in that fundamental loss of freedom, we've lost the deepest sense of what it means to love on a daily basis. So this phenomenon is something we have to kind of address. And this phenomenon in the church has been called what they call the divided life. None of us, I suspect, in this room would say that the purpose of my life is to be careful, the purpose of my life is to make as much money as I can, the purpose of my life is to climb the corporate ladder. But sometimes, if we're honest about it, that sometimes our actions start to move us in this direction, even though our words start to say something else whether those words are affected by ethics, whether it's affected by faith. And what happens is we get this understanding of what we call the divided life. Newman once said that sometimes we can keep our principles in our words, but we've lost them in our hearts. And so this issue of the divided life is a major issue in the document. And the document says this, the vocation document says, Dividing the demands of one's faith from one's work and business is a fundamental error that contributes to much of the damage done by businesses in our world today, including overwork to the detriment of family or spiritual life, an unhealthy attachment to power to the detriment of one's own good, and the abuse of economic power in order to make even greater economic gains. I think one of the most important philosophers in the United States right now, although he's uh, British, his name is Alistair McIntyre, and he calls this life, this, this divided life, compartmentalization. McIntyre explains that the family and work life are often organized in distinct spheres, each with its own highly specific standards of success and failure, and what is accounted effectiveness in the roles of the home is not at all the same of what is accounted in the roles of the family. And we have, in a sense, normalized this. This is why a, a, a church document uh, back in the 60s out of Vatican II said this. It says, one of the most serious errors of our age is the split between religion and faith and the professional and work life. And so the document highlights this question, and it attempts to try to overcome and deal with this question and try to be honest. And so this afternoon, I want to ask three questions. These, qu these qu three questions are not necessarily asked in the document, but they're implied in the document. And these three questions, I think, are big questions that get at what we need to, what we need to discuss. And the first one is an obvious one. What am I working for? Because for many of us, we simply work way too much to deprive ourselves of a good answer to this. Our students work way too much to deprive themselves of this as well. And yet, there's a paradox here. The paradox is we will never get a good answer to that question only from work itself, which means the second question. And this is an odd question. 
But it is an important question. What am I resting in? What am I receiving? As Genesis says in the first chapter, we are made not only to work, but we are also made to rest. And for us to really understand what business is about, what work is about, we have to understand this dynamic of what we mean by rest. And if we can understand what we are to give ourselves to and what we are to receive, we get to the deeper question about what am I living for? So these are the three questions I'd like to engage with you this afternoon in light of this document that we call the vocation of the business leader. My comments this afternoon are largely focused on the last section of the document where it talks about the Witnesses for Actions Act. I believe it begins in about paragraph 66 or so. But really, my whole talk is really based on this section. So these are the three questions. Now, like any academic, there's a kind of academic hazard, right? If it doesn't fit within a matrix, it doesn't seem to exist. I don't know what it is. Academics have this great thing. I have to create a matrix to, to get. Now, my point of the matrix is that you and I are way too complicated to be put in boxes. But the point of the matrix is simply is to give you a, it's, it's a teaching tool. It's a pedagogical tool to get my ideas out in kind of a brief form, a, a kind of a visual form. And then we can have a conversation of Q&A after I'm done with it. So with a matrix, academics also like a thesis. And so here's my thesis. You might want to challenge me on this thesis, but it is actually a thesis with, that's found in this document, and it is this. You and I will never get work right unless we get leisure right. You and I will never get business right unless we get rest right. All right? That's the thesis. And see if you kind of think that's a thesis that's defendable. So what I will be doing is I'm going to start right there in the uh, uh, bottom left-hand corner, and I'm going to kind of just fill up these boxes. And what we're going to do is give you three views about how do people look at their work, how do they look at their leisure, and how do they put it together, okay? That's essentially the talk, and, and much of the contents of this is kind of peppered through this document called The Vocation of the Business Leader. So first, the first view of work is commonly understood as a job. I mentioned to you that I grew up on the south side of Chicago in a blue collar neighborhood. And if my friends, my former colleagues, my former uh, schoolmates knew that I was here talking to you about work as a, as a vocation, they'd say, you know what, Mike, you've been in the ivory tower a bit too long. It's simply about the money. Why do you think people play the lottery? They played a lottery to get out of work, not to have more work. It's simply about the money. Don't try to expect more from work than it can provide. Most likely, they would quote a fellow Chicagoan. I don't know if any of you remember a man named Mike Royko. He's the, a columnist, Chicago Sun-Times, Chicago Tribune. And Royko put it this way. He said, if work is so great, how come they have to pay us to do it? Huh? Come on, let's get serious, he would say. But it's interesting, this is not only a blue collar phenomenon, but I think this is increasingly becoming a professional phenomenon. Those of you who may be in the area of law know the dominance of the billable hour. The increasing dominance of that factor has caused lawyers to often think that one hour of law actually does equal $500 or $400 or whatever fee that they're gonna charge. And what's also interesting, behavioral uh, economists have pointed this out, that when people work for money, their satisfaction rates of their work go down. And so lawyers who often have no time for mentoring, no time for discussions of the nature of justice, no time for pro bono work, are in a sense a more unhappier lot they are now today than they were years ago when those issues were in a sense present in their law firms. But this is not just for lawyers, it's also increasingly for doctors, for nurses, and obviously for the whole realm of business, particularly for those who are constantly incentivized. They are constantly driven by incentives to think that somehow the incentives are the thing that actually drives their work. Now, why would someone do this? Or how, how, would, how would leadership begin to look at this? Often the leader here is the technocrat or bureaucrat. And the criterion of truth within business is simply metrics for efficiency and utility. As you often say, we even hear this in the academy so much, if it can't be measured, it doesn't exist. This is the fundamental premise of the, 
of the bureaucrat and the technocrat. But of course, we know that the problem of measurement is the more you tend to measure something, the more you tend to drive the spirit out of it, which is why so many people don't like education. Or Einstein's line, which I'm sure many of you have heard, although there's sometimes dispute about whether he's said this, but other people have said so, that not everything that can be counted counts, and not everything that counts can be counted. So this idea of leadership is often seen within this kind of phenomenon of the bureaucrat or the technocrat, and their understanding of job is simply there. Now, why would people have a view of leadership and of work like this? There's lots of reasons. I mean, let's be very clear. Some jobs are so bureaucratic, so mindless, so awful, that the only value you can get out of the work is money. But I think actually there's a deeper reason about why people look at their work this way. And I think it has a lot to do with the question of leisure, especially this idea of leisure or rest as amusement. We live in what some people have called a highly entertaining culture. Some of the highest paid people in our, in our culture are entertainers. We do have a lot of starving artists, but nonetheless, we love to be entertained. That is why so many people who are in the entertainment industry get so much money. Matter of fact, here's my one political statement for today. We even, in a sense, uh, 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 subsidize them through state funding for their own particular stadiums. I shouldn't have said that, but I can't help myself sometimes, right? But anyhow, there is a sense that we love to be entertained. We love to be entertained. But the way the entertainment is understood is of a very particular sort. I don't know if those of you, some of you listen to Billy Joel, but he has this wonderful song called The Piano Man when he says, they know it's been me, they've been coming to see, to forget about life for a while. Our entertainment, our amusement is a form of escape. Or a French social critic philosopher Jacques Rouleau once put it this way, instead of being the moment when we rediscover ourselves thinking about who we ought to be, Leisure is the moment when amusements succeed to the maximum in making us forget. You know, one of the great things, um, which is always kind of fun to do, is the idea of etymologies. What are the roots of words? Look at the word amusement for a second. Where does that word come from? It comes from the Greek word where we get the word muses. And the muses were the patron of the liberal arts, the goddesses of liberal arts, which were meant to refresh people, that were meant to, in a sense, help people see the larger vision of the world, right? But you all know that when you put the word ought in front of it, it negates it. If I'm a theist, I believe in God. If I put an ought in front of it, I'm an atheist, I don't believe in God. Well, look up the dictionary word. You have to go a few down on this one, of amusement. Here's the definition, to look stupidly at something. This is my wife's description of me watching television, right? right? To look stupidly at something. I mean, that's an interesting kind of phenomenon about how we often understand our amusements. Now, this form of amusement is, in a sense, embedded often in our economic system. A lot of advertisement is premised on it. I was in Chicago a couple years ago, and I picked up a U.S. day today, and there was a there was a uh, advertisement for a hotel chain, and it said the weekend getaway, your body checks in and your mind checks out, and thus our form of the weekend has been this kind of form of escape, in all sorts of different ways, and thus when we talk about Las Vegas, right, the weekend getaway, and we all know the tagline, whatever happens in Vegas, stays in Vegas, right. Now, whoever said that should be sued because the only thing that stays in Vegas is your money. Everything else comes right back with you. That's the nature of human activity. But this idea of the weekend has also influenced our understanding of celebration in general. The very nature of celebration has become an, an amusement. Thus, tomorrow we will be celebrating Halloween a highly ghoulish kind of reality that has become, has been taken over. It's taken over the world. I lived in Rome in 2003. There was nothing on Halloween. I was there in 2012, and it's starting to look like the U.S. It's just not an American phenomenon. It's becoming a global phenomenon. But we have the commercialization of Christmas, the utter decadence of Mardi Gras and St. Patrick's Day, right? the trivialization of Easter. All of these 
holidays, all these celebrations were meant to do what? Even Halloween was meant to help us see a larger reality. It was meant to, in a sense, recreate us, the recreation, to recreate us, to see a larger horizon. And now what had they become? They become frenetic activities of consumption. So this question of leisure has had its impact. So what is being sought here? If I look at my work as a job, and I look at my leisure as an amusement, life simply becomes a series of gratifications. John Paul put this in this way. He called it consumerism. Where we're more concerned about what we have and less concerned about what we're becoming. And thus, the logic of the market seems to operate here, that choice is the highest value, not the content of the choice. We can't even make a judgment on the content of the choice because personal preference is the dominant value system that one would have in a market system. So what does that tell us? It tells us that the focus often on the first view is focused in the area of leisure and it particularly is an understanding of amusement. But there's something odd about this that has, in a sense, undermined this view, and here it is. The view of leisure here, in a sense, becomes a view that begins to cost a lot of money. And thus, the pressures that often happen in this view of leisure causes people to work more. And thus, we have the work-spend cycle. And thus, we are working more in order to afford the spending that often occurs. Now, by the way, let's be clear. There's a lot of people work a lot of hours because they're so paid so poorly that they have to work many hours. And that is a problem. Low wage wages is a big problem. But for a lot of people, that work is often a sense to foster a lifestyle. There's a woman named Juliet Shore wrote a book called The Overworked American. And then in the, the year 2000, we surpassed the Japanese as one of the hardest working Western industrialized countries in the world. We are working more than anybody, precisely for this reason. So, view number one. View number two, some people look at their work as a career. And here, the importance that people like to work, and I hope you like your work. I like my work. I like going to work. Even if I won the lottery, I'd still go to work. Because why? There's a great degree of psychological satisfaction that occurs, a great degree of intrinsic motivations. And thus, one can be creative, one can be autonomous, it's certainly personally satisfying. There's a guy who wrote a book called Flow, and he pointed out that there's often, for a lot of people, a flow or a zone where one feels that his task or her task is matched with the ability and it stretches their ability. And they often have a great degree of satisfaction of the accomplishments that they've had. There's a Latin term called, called homo faber, Man the maker, man the creator. We are meant to create. We are meant to work. As a bird is to fly, Pius XII once put it, the man, the person is meant to work. It's in the DNA that it's part of who we are. But it's interesting, well, what kind of work often does career foster? Again, look at the etymology of the word career. It's interesting, it comes from a French word, carrière that carries one into society. It is the automobile, the self-driven vehicle that gets me from here to there. But often not asking any larger question about why I should go there, not asking the social question about what is the good to be done, not asking the spiritual question about whether is this what God wants me to do. And thus, here, the leader is often seen not as money mad, here, or technically kind of simply focus, but here the leader is often goal-oriented. They want to achieve things, the thrill of accomplishment, and often their identity is focused precisely on what they've been able to achieve. But why would someone look at their work like this? Why would that be the view that they would have? I would say it has a lot to do with the question of leisure, not leisure as amusement or rest as amusement, but leisure as utility. Let me explain what I mean by this. I'll give you two examples. One is that education is increasingly justified based on its instrumental value to career. 
It is almost hard right now to even think that we would think of education as anything but this. But certainly within the Greek, Roman, and Christian tradition, education was not seen as that way. Matter of fact, the very word education comes from a Latin word by the name of schola, which is where we get the word scholar and school. So by the way, every semester I start off with my students, and I say, you are at leisure, right? They don't buy it. They just don't buy it. But why would the Greek, Roman, and Christian tradition understand leisure or understand education as leisure? Because why? The liberal arts, the arts that free you, the arts that help you to see a larger reality, to receive a larger reality not simply to exercise your own interests to further to maximize your own utility. There was a different view that was operating, but in a utilitarian culture, education simply gets reduced to this. But this is not only true for education, this is actually true for the very nature of rest itself. That often rest is justified to sharpen the saw in order to become more productive. I like Stephen Covey a lot, but this is one of his, I think this is his seventh habit in his book, habit, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And I think it's a problem that if we look at our rest as simply to sharpen the saw, we have, in a sense, given over all of life to its work reality. Let me just give you an example why I think this is a problem. There is a psychologist by the name of Sandor Ferenczi, a Hungarian psychologist, and he was the one who coined the term Sunday neurosis. And basically, he coined it for this reason. He says, why is it, he said, that I, in a sense, engage so many patients that when they are, in a sense, most diseased, most bored, most full of angst, most full of meaninglessness, it tends to happen on Sundays? Why is that? Well, the obvious answer might be, well, because they have to go to work on Monday. And he said, he says, I don't think that's the case. He says, I think the reason is that they've spent the day trying to rest, and they don't know how to rest, and they've gotten themselves nuts. Right? There are certain things we must do for the right reason. T.S. Eliot has that great line, to do the right deed for the wrong reason is the greatest treason. If I love my wife to get something out of her, no matter how many great things I have done, I've already undermined the relationship. And rest is one of those things that one has to do it for the right reason. And work is not simply that reason. Now, it should be said, if you rest, you will often, in a sense, be better at work. But you don't rest to simply sharpen the law, saw to get to rest. So what does that tell us? It tells us this. That if I look at my work as a career and I look at my leisure as this kind of utility function, I often, in a sense, define my life in terms of my achievements. Again, John Paul uses the term consumerism, that we're more concerned about what we have done and less concerned about what that doing has done to who we are. We see this all the time. I hate to pick on Jack Welch, the former CEO of uh, General Electric, but a lot of people say, you know, he's a real jerk. But boy, look what he did, right? right? We excuse often people's character or even excuse their, their behaviors for their achievements. We've done this with athletes. We've done this with musicians. We've done this with all sorts of people about what they're able to do, but we often lose track about what they are, in a sense, have they become. Let me give you two examples of this maybe less dramatic, but nonetheless still an issue. I'm sure some people in this room remember Lee Iacocca. Maybe the young students don't, but uh, Lee Iacocca was the former CEO of the Chrysler Corporation. He was considered the kind of economic icon of American industry by turning Chrysler around, was in bankruptcy, turned it around, and made it a su successful company. Well, when he retired from Chrysler, about two years afterwards, he was on the front cover a Fortune magazine with this caption, how I flunked retirement. This kind of economic giant at work, this man who knew exactly who he was as the CEO of the Chrysler Corporation, was a man who felt very uneasy, very uncomfortable, 
very insecure outside of that reality. On one hand, the economic giant, here a kind of spiritual dwarf. A kind of phenomenon that in a sense made him, in a sense that his work was, has exhausted him and that outside of work, he had a hard time understanding who he was as a person. One can only admire Lee Iacocca that he had the guts and, and the, in a sense, in many sense, the courage to reflect on that in public. Most of us are not usually that, that, uh, that open. Or if you remember this man, we should all remember this man, particularly those of us in the United States, former president of the United States, Lyndon Baines Johnson. When he retired from the presidency, a woman named Doris Kunz Goodwin wrote his biography, and she went down to a ranch and got to know LBJ quite well. A couple years ago, several years ago, she had an article in the New York Times reflecting on this experience, and here's what she said. She said, and yet this man, LBJ, I saw in his retirement, had spent so many years in pursuit of work, power, and individual success that he had absolutely no psychic or emotional resources left to commit himself to anything once the presidency was taken from him. Years of concentration solely on work meant that in his retirement he could find no solace in recreation, sports or hobbies, or a community life, or his family, or certainly a spiritual life, right? There's something about work that can actually deplete people rather than fulfill them. And here we have to get at a very interesting point that's mentioned in the document. It's a very important point, and it's what we call the subjective dimension of work, that when we go to work, we have to change things. And if we don't change things, and we don't change it well, we should get fired, because that's part of work. But when you work, you simultaneously change things in here. And we often can become great experts on the objective changes. And we become, in a sense, almost ignorant of its subjective changes. This is the fundamental insight of the Christian tradition in terms of how to see the importance of work. And so, I don't know if you have this in your house, but my wife, I, I call it refrigerator wisdom. And usually I think it's a message that's directed toward me. I mean, it's usually for the whole family, but I think it's often, it's like, oh, I think he could use this. This one was up on the refrigerator for a long, long time. And so here's what it says, which I think captures exactly what I want to get at. And it's this, watch your thoughts, they become words. Watch your words, they become actions. Watch your actions, they become habits. Watch your habits, they become character. Watch your character, it becomes your destiny. This is for all activity. This is for all action, especially in our work. Because here's the thing. You and I are not just called to do work. You and I are called to be a particular kind of person at work, a particular kind of leader at work. And this character is of critical importance. But this character is of critical importance because our choices are the prime indicators of our destiny. Our choices take us somewhere. It never leaves us the same. And from the Christian perspective, from the eschatological vision, it is this. We become eternally what we have given ourselves to. Thus, work is a very important phenomenon, a very important reality that all of us need to take more cons consideration of. So what does that tell us? Well, I guess it tells us that we, we got a big problem. <laughs> At least I think it tells me we have a big problem. And in the document, this is not just a secular problem, but this is a problem for all people. In the document, it speaks to both Christians as well as pe all people of goodwill. But let me read to you what the document says to Christians about this question. And it says this, and it's, it's the concern about what we might call assimilation. Christians have accommodated themselves to the world, living as if God does not exist. They not only live in the world, but they have become of the world. When Christian business leaders fail to live the gospel in their organizations, their lives conceal rather than reveal the authentic face of God and religion. Let me give you this in a rather pippy area. I once had a friend of mine say to me, and he was critiquing largely economists and, and financial uh, academics, and this is what he says. He says, if I believed in God, 
as much as they, these economists, believe in the market, I'd be a mystic, right? Many people in business, one of the dangers of business, and there's many, just like there are many dangers of the academy, by the way. Let me make sure of that, particularly intellectual pride and all sorts of other things. But one of the dangers of business is that sometimes we have way too much confidence in the market. We think the markets can solve all our problems. If anything, the financial crisis has pointed out to us is that when we discount virtue, we discount our humanity. So what does that tell us? It tells us that we have to look to a new view. And in the document, it speaks about this idea of work and business and leadership as a vocation. And it is trying to move from this logic of the market to fundamentally what I would call and what Benedict calls and what the document calls the logic of gift. The fundamental premise is the idea of a gift. Because the vocation comes from a Latin word vocari, which means to call. And in the deepest sense of that call, it is a call to give of oneself. And thus, it is a universal call to all humanity to love. It is in the DNA about how we are structured. In a other church document from Vatican II, it says this, a person cannot fully find himself except through a sincere gift of himself. You and I are always at our best, not when we're calculating, not when we're measuring up our utility maximization self-interest. Right? You and I are always at our best when we are given of ourselves to the other in self-surrender, in self-sacrifice, in all sorts of things of that sort. This is the fundamental element of all human culture that they get it in terms of one's gift of oneself. Now here I'm gonna be a bit more specific, but that's the kind of first vocation. The first call is to be human, not to be an entrepreneur, not to be a professor, not to be a business leader, not to be even a student. One's first call is to be human. The second call is to often what we call a state of life. And in the Catholic tradition, we often divide that in terms of lay life, religious life, and priesthood life. And in most religions, the lay life is most important. And often in that lay life is marriage. And the fundamental importance of that, of that vocation should never be underestimated. A good colleague of mine, Bob Kennedy, put it this way. He says, my wife only has one husband and my children only have one dad. My students have a lot more teachers. One's work should never ever sacrifice one's fundamental covenant commitment to one's spouse and certainly to one's children. And yet, if you talk to people, men and women, this is often where great concern, particularly leaders, great tensions occur between the vocation of being a husband or a wife, a vocation of being a mother and a father, and the vocation of working. Those three vocations are often in tension and often cause great consternation for many people. But as important as the state of life is, we are called to work. And the document says, particularly in business, business joins together people's gifts, talents, and energies and skills to serve the needs of others. This in turn supports the development of people who do the work. Business is about bringing people's gifts and skills and talents for the goods of the world. That is a wonderful vocation. And so this idea of work as giving and a kind of logic of gift, not just simply a logic of market, because the logic of market is essentially about acquisitions. It's an important logic. One has to understand it when one's in business. But if it dominates, it causes its own particular problems. This is the embedded thing. Logic of market must be embedded in this larger market, logic, the larger logic of gift. And again, if we look at other cultures, we some, see some very interesting things. For example, there's an interesting book by a man named Lewis High called The Gift. And he starts off the book talking about the exchange that happened between Puritans and the Native Americans. You all remember the kind of classic understanding of this. And when these two cultures met, and this often happens when cultures meet, they exchanged gifts. And when they went away and they came back and saw each other again, the Native Americans noticed that the Puritans, the white people, still had a gift. And they asked for it back, which is where we get the term Indian givers. 
Now, we see it as a derogatory term. Of course, we don't use it anymore. That's good. But when we were kids, we used it all the time, right? But what we fail to understand, this often happens with culture, we fail to see what's actually happening underneath the culture. What was happening underneath the culture is that the Native Americans knew quite clearly that when you are given a gift, and if you hold on to that gift, and you use that gift only for yourself, the gift corrupts you. John Paul calls it the law of the gift. That's the way gifts are. Gifts have to go through you for the other. It is the only way that the gift fulfills you. Right? So this nature of the gift, the nature of how one looks at one's work, for the gift for things to be done for others is of crucial importance. And so in the document, it talks about the giftedness that should move to a new set of principles. And it talks about the business is about good goods, good work, and good wealth. The business meets the needs of the, world, of, the, of, of the work by creating goods that are truly good and services that truly serve. That good work is fostering the dignity of work by helping coworkers develop their gifts and talents. And that good wealth is that you create sustainable wealth so that it can be distributed justly. The document lays these three things out as the fundamental nature about the good that business is about. Now, we could talk a lot more about what the document says about these goods, and they are very important, the principles that go along with it. But let me present to you a problem. Actually, let me, let me present to you what I think is my problem. I go to work every day, and I love my work, and I give out as much as I can. I am married. I have five children. I do as much as I can in that. I have a church, community, volunteers. I do all that stuff. And I give myself as much as I can. And then all of a sudden, this little voice starts occurring in my head, saying, well, why don't they work as hard as I do? And, 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 and why am I putting so much forward and they're not? And, and why, am I, why am I putting forward 60 and 70 percent, but my wife is only putting 30 or 40? By the way, I, I, I just say that to myself. I don't say that out loud. Uh, right, right. And so I get in this, and, and I know somebody here knows my wife, so I better be careful here. Um, but there's this kind of victimization problem that often occurs, and I feel like I'm victimized. And then a certain kind of resentment starts to occur. And thus this power of giving, which was supposed to help me, has now become kind of a temptation of, of kind of corruption. And thus, what happens is I start to become cynical. And thus, something starts to happen. And I think what happens is this. A friend of mine, Ken Goodpastor, put it well. It's a Latin aphorism that goes like this. Nemo dot quad non habit. You cannot give what you do not have. You cannot give what you do not have. And if all we do is work, we simply exhaust ourselves which is why the question of leisure, not as amusement, not as utility, but leisure as contemplation. That the first fundamental act, and this is said right in the document, the first fundamental act of the Christian business leader, as well as all Christians, and to be quite frank, as, as all people, is to receive, and more specifically, to receive what God has done for him or her. This is what causes deep gratitude. As one friend of mine once said, at the end of the day, there are simply two kinds of people, those who are grateful and those who are resentful, those who feel like things have been given to them and those who feel that they always have gotten a bad deal. So what does this idea of this receivement, what does this idea of leisure start to look like? Let me give you three habits of leisure, of resting, of receiving. The first one is the habit of solitude and of silence, of stillness. The scriptures are just full of this kind of reality. And it is not just simply the silence out there, but the most difficult thing is the silence in here. Right? I don't know about you, by the way, but I have these tapes. I guess I should call them MP3 players now, right? But I got these tapes that go on all the time, right? I'm always ranking. I'm always ranking. Who's better? Who's worse? I always have the kind of illusions of grandeur. I, I, I walk about two and a quarter miles to school, and I can solve every problem at St. Thomas in that two and a quarter miles, right? right? And I'll, sometimes I can, I can also get into debates in my head with my, with my fellow faculty member, my nemesis, right? By the way, I win every debate in my head. I've never lost one. 
if only reality could be like that, right? And there's a sense that I am not at rest. Matter of fact, I'm exhausted by those tapes, but I don't even know it. And thus, that wonderful line that Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary, and I will give you rest. Because often, I can't give myself rest. So the idea of this idea of solitude and silence, of stopping the tapes and receiving that which I don't know what I need to receive. The second habit is the habit of celebration, of weekly Sabbath and worship. A reality is becoming harder and harder these days. But by the way, this is where we need to look to the Jews for this. The Jews get this much better than the Christians or anybody else. The importance of resting every seven days. And this is very difficult to do. A lot to be said on this, but here's, what, here's one challenge I'll throw out to all of you. It's a challenge I often have difficulty doing, but nonetheless, I think what we should become is techno sabbatarians Give your technology a rest. Try it for at least four hours. See if you can disconnect for four hours. Do you know what the new term is right now? Psychological, there's a psychological manual, internet anxiety disorders. People can't let go of their devices. They can't detach from them. That's a problem. That's not normal. Although I'm afraid it's increasingly becoming normal. And lastly, the idea of going to the margins, the habit of service. Jean Vanier, who started the L'Arche movement, put it this way. He says, what we need to do is not simply do things for those on the margins, the lonely, the elderly, the poor, those who, in a sense, can't so-called do anything. We're not there just to do things for them. But if we are with them, they will give things to us that no one else can. This is a fundamental principle in the Christian tradition about the importance of the poor and never losing sight or touch with the poor. So these three habits, I think, are of critical importance. Let me give you a story. Um, all Catholics seem to have Mother Teresa stories. I, I can't help it, right? But I met Mother Teresa twice in my life. Once was in Chicago, and the other was in Calcutta, India. I was giving a talk in Calcutta at the Indian Institute of Management, and my host, his name was Deva Shish Chatterjee, knew I was Catholic, and he says, would you like to go meet Mother Teresa? I said, sure. And so we got in the car, we drove down to the mother house, we walked in, and there's Mother Teresa. And my Hindu friend, Deva, she drops to his knees, and he's trying to kiss her feet. And Mother Teresa's trying to pick him up, and he's trying to kiss the feet, and there's this kind of wrestling match going on right in front of me. And honest to goodness, I'm sitting there twiddling my thumbs, and the only thought that came to my head Seriously, was this, man, she has big feet. Gosh, she is really short. Boy, she is really old. And aren't you an idiot that you can't think of something more profound, right? I got the icon of holiness sitting right there, and all I can think about were feet, right? Well, we had about a 20-minute conversation, and she was delightful. She asked us questions. She told us about her ministry. We asked her, and as we were leaving, she says, I want to give you my business card. And this is what was on her business card. No fax number, no telephone number. It was this. The fruit of silence is prayer. The fruit of prayer is faith. The fruit of faith is love. The fruit of love is service. And the fruit of service is peace. You may think of Mother Teresa as a nice little nun who kind of did things, but she had operations over 90 countries. She was a very busy woman. But she started every day not with her agenda, not with what she wanted, but what she ought to receive. She started in silence. And in that deep silence came great prayer. And in that prayer came great faith. And in that faith, love and service and a peace, not so much a peace that in a sense she had no problems. She actually had a tumultuous spiritual life. But she knew that this is where she would be. I am to be here, not somewhere else. So, what does this tell us? If we can look at our work as a vocation, and if we can look at our leisure as contemplation, we get the ingredients of what real integrity is about. The word integrity comes from a Latin word, integritas, and it's interesting enough, it has two meanings. The first one's kind of obvious. It's where we get the word integer, a whole number, to be whole, integration. And thus, this is something that we've been constantly talking about, the importance of bringing things together. We live in a world that's constantly trying to divide things, the point of how do you put things together. But the interesting thing about 
integritas, it also comes from a word where it, it has the meaning of being untouched. There's a negative principle in integrity, in, and then the verb is tengere, which means touch, to be untouched. And thus, the world has touched us, not always for the good. It has developed its own particular corruption, its own particular cynicism, compromisation, compromising, all these things that, in a sense, has done us in. And sometimes we have to step away from the world, which is why the importance of leisure is of critical importance. It is not a secondary, it is not an optional activity. It is a critical activity to our humanity. Let me give you an example of this. This idea of leading a leader with integrity, what I would call the contemplative practitioner. I'm sure many of you are familiar with uh, Jim Collins' work, Good to Great. And in there, he had a chapter which was put into um, uh, the Harvard Business Review about the fifth level leader. And he talked about the two fundamental qualities of the fifth level leader. The first one was about ha someone having great resolve. By the way, this is a talk not to say that we just kind of take it easy. This is a talk that we says that also says you got to work hard at being a leader. You have to have great resolve. You have to give of yourself to others. But what was interesting about Collins is he says that's only one quality of the great leader. The second one, he says, is humility. And while he doesn't put it in this way, that humility is all about receptivity. It's about people who received their sickness. It's about people, in a sense, who received life. People who received faith. People who received the wisdom of their parents. All those things which were of critical importance to the greatness of these leaders. So let me begin to wrap up. What do I have here? I have a full matrix. What do you know? Right, there we go. Now, let me say something about the matrix. First thing, it's a pedagogical tool. If we push this matrix, it falls apart. It doesn't describe all of life. Matrix can't do that, right? Matrices can't do that. But it's just a way of, 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 of kind of putting this information out there. And, this, and, and along with that, the fact is many of us are all over the map. If I took away all the lines, right, depending on the day, sometimes I look at my work as a job. Tomorrow I might look at it as a career. The day after that I might look at it as a vocation. Sometimes I might look at my work as a vocation, but my, my whole leisure life is about amusements and vice versa. So it's not an attempt to, one has to be careful of trying to be too forceful with this. The second point I want to make is there is nothing wrong with work as a job. I work for money. I've gone into my academic vice president twice in my career asking for more money because there's nothing wrong with wanting to live better. Right? There's also nothing wrong with a career. When someone tells you, you have done great work, we are giving you more responsibility, and on top of that, we're giving you a particular title, that feels great. That shows affirmation. That's a good thing. But the problem is that those two views of work are simply too small for the human spirit. They have to, in a sense, be within a much larger reality. St. Augustine in the Confessions puts it well when he says this. He says, the house of my soul is too small for you to come to it. May it be enlarged by you. The idea of vocation is providing a larger view of work. A job and a career, while important, is still too small for the human spirit. It's often too small for God to act within it. And the same thing can be said for leisure. There's nothing wrong with amusements. There's nothing wrong with the idea of utility. But they are too small for the human spirit. And finally, the last point I want to make is on the word integrity, the integration of work and leisure. You remember at the beginning of the talk, in the document, it talks about the divided life. You and I are divided. It is part of the human condition. It is what the Christians talk about in terms of original sin of the fall. It is a reality that we have to confront. It's not something to say, often a lot of us don't think we are divided, but actually we are. And thus, the idea of integrity for all of us is something we ought to be very careful of, of in a sense, gain or kind of acquiring or claiming too quickly or too smugly. Integrity is a lifelong project. We often don't know where our divisions are because we are, in a sense, blind to them. Which is why, at the end of the day, within the Christian tradition, it is not justice that is at the heart of the social teachings of its own tradition, but it's charity. 
And Benedict defines charity this way. Charity is a love that is received and given. At the heart of this whole reality, in terms of a heart of our own development and the work that we are, we have to first receive. And in that receiving, we then have the capacity to give and to create business and to create organizations that further the humanization of the world. So thank you very much.